Okay, good morning, everybody, because here's morning for me. I'm a, I'm a work at the Institute of Chemical Biology, School of Science, University of the Republic in Uruguay. I'm here in Uruguay, South America, small country between two big countries, uh, Argentina and Brazil. So it's morning for me. Uh, first, I would like to thank uh, Lara, Lara Donaldson, for the kind invitation. And I will give you, um, I would like to give you a broad picture of what we are doing in the field of uh, biochemistry, redox biochemistry. So uh, let me start with this. This was the cover of a journal, Trends in Biological Science, in 1992. That's when I started to work in redox biochemistry. At that time, we talk about free radicals. So in this picture, you can see a, a cell background being destroyed by these creatures, free radicals at work. So we talk about free radicals as biological oxidants, and then the cell responds with a different antioxidants and the concept of oxidative stress rose. You probably heard of the term ROS, reactive oxygen species. And you heard of ROS as uh, free radicals, as very reactive, uh, toxic byproducts of aerobic metabolism. But not all of this is true. We have to be clear that ROS is not only one chemical species. Under the term, the name ROS, we include a big group of compounds. Some of them are free radicals, some not. Some are oxidants and very reactive, but some are not. So we have different species, chemical species with different uh, reactivities that we call ROS. First, oxygen in aerobic organism at the mitochondria, especially, there's a leakage of electrons that re partially reduce oxygen to this radical, superoxide and ion radical. It is not very strong oxidant. In fact, sometimes works as a reductant, but it's a free radical and it rapidly dismutates to hydrogen peroxide Hydrogen peroxide is not a radical, and it's more oxidant than superoxide, but not that much, but can react with the reduced iron in a mechanism known as phantom reaction to yield a very reactive, strong oxidant that is hydroxyl radical. Later on, radicals centered on the nitrogen, not the oxygen, appears, and that was nitric oxide, NO. An NO is a radical being formed by an enzyme, nitric oxide synthase, in our organisms, in our body, um, to, and has uh, physiological functions. There's a rapid termination reaction between radical NO and radical superoxide to form a non-radical species, peroxynitrate, that is more oxidant than their radical precursors. Perocinator can directly react and oxidize biomolecules, but can also homolyze and give rise to radicals. OH dot, hydroxyl radical, NO2 radical, and also carbonate radical. So there's, uh, under the name of ROS, there's a big group of compounds with different properties. We know that um, ROS and RNS for reactive nitrogen species can be formed endogenously as a consequence of oxygen metabolism, but also as the product of uh, enzymatic reactions. I told you about NOS that forms NO, but also 
NADPH oxidase, noxes form superoxide or hydrogen peroxide, and also can be formed by the action of uh, different environmental agents like UV, light, or smoke. And it's well documented that these ROS RNS species uh, are very reactive with uh, proteins, lipids, uh, DNA, and can alter and damage cellular function. <clears throat> The, um, the organism responds with a battery of antioxidants that could be low molecular weight antioxidants like glutathione, for example, this tripeptide. Also high molecular weight antioxidants like enzymes, catalase, superoxide dismutase, get rid of these oxidant species and try to keep ROS levels low. But when the redox homeostasis is affected, a condition of uh, oxidative stress can be generated. And this oxidative stress is associated with different pathologies like cancer, cardiovascular, neurodegenerative diseases, and also with aging. In 1992, Helmut Sis defined oxidative stress as perturbation of the balance pro-oxidant antioxidant in favor of the former yielding cellular damage. But the concept of oxidative stress have changed over the years. And now oxidative distress is associated with the high levels of ROS leading to cellular damage, but there is also another stress called oxidative stress by Helmut Seals that um, conceive that uh, low fluxes of ROS can challenge um, a redox response and are essential in redox signaling. So the concept of ROS not, to, not yielding cellular damage, but actually triggering an antioxidant response arose. And among all the raw species, hydrogen peroxide has emerged as a second messenger in this redox signaling pathway. We focus our studies on an enzyme that reduces hydrogen peroxide. It's a peroxidase but it's a particular peroxidase, it's a thiol-dependent peroxidase. It doesn't have a heme like catalase that also reduce hydrogen peroxide. It doesn't have a selenium, amino acid, selenium, amino acid, selenocysteine amino acid like glutathione peroxidase. It has a common residue of cysteine that is the catalytic residue responsible for the reduction of the peroxide substrate. We know that thiols react with hydrogen peroxide to yield the sulfinic acid derivative and hydrogen peroxide is reduced to water. The rate content of this reaction with amino acid cysteine is 26 per molar per second. But when that cysteine form is part of a peroxyredoxin, this is peroxyredoxin 2 from uh, humans, the rate constant is more than a million times faster. So we can say, well, cysteine 51, that is the reactive system in BRX2, is a highly reactive thiol. The thing is that uh, 1651 from PRX2 reacts ordinary with most reagents, thiol reagents like iodacetamide or malamides, chloramines. It reacts only with hydrogen peroxide um, and other peroxides really fast. So it looks like the enzyme 
is designed to specifically reduce peroxide. The reaction starts with the thiolate, with the nucleophilic attack of the thiolate to the distal oxygen of the peroxide. And the, the, the negative uh, charge is uh, delocalized in the transition state between the sulfur and the oxygen. Then the peroxidatic oxygen, the peroxide bond breaks and the living group retains the negative charge. So the, the, the species that is reacting with the peroxide substrate is the thiolate, not the thiol. So it was assumed that the high reactivity of this system called peroxidatic system in PRX is attributed to its low K. We measure the PK of a human perox peroxyredoxin 2. The PK of the peroxidatic system of PRX2 was 5.3. And indeed, it's lower than 8.3, the PK of a cysteine amino acid. But there are other enzymes that have a cysteine with a much lower PK that doesn't react as fast with hydrogen peroxide. For example, papain with a cysteine PK of 3.4 is not as reactive as peroxyredoxin 2 with H2O2. If we consider the PK of different, of different thiol proteins, here's a list with different PKs of the thiol in the protein, and we calculate how much thiolate is present at pH 7.4, this thiolate availability, it doesn't change that much, you can see, even though there's a big change in the PK of the thiol. So the factor of our thiolate availability is not the answer for the high reactivity of the peroxidatic system of peroxyredoxins. There is also the structure at the active site, the environmental um, protein that um, increase the reactivity with the peroxide. The protein structure not only activate the thiolate at the active site, but also stabilize the transition state better than the thiolate. We think that the high reactivity is because of the protein structure of the active site of PRX is able to stabilize the thiolate of the peroxidatic system when there's no peroxide substrate. But when the peroxide substrate approach to the active site, it has the capacity to shift hydrogen bonds from the thiolate to stabilize the transition state so that the peroxidative bond can cleave easily and the living group retain the negative charge. Well, peroxyredoxins are present in all organisms. They are ubiquitous enzymes, highly conserved. The acticide also is highly conserved. There are six isoforms in mammals. They are present at high concentrations in different subcellular locations. They are classified considering the number of uh, cysteine residues at the active site. Let me, um, let me get the pointer, laser pointer. Let's see if I can do it here. Okay. Um, so there are six isoforms in mammals. Um, and I told you that they classify depending on the number of uh, cysteines present in the active site or in the catalytic cycle. 
Most of them are two cis peroxyredoxins, so they have peroxidatic cysteine, but also they have another cysteine at the active site, the resolutive system that forms the uh, disulfide. If it's intermolecular, they are typical to cis, but they can also form an intramolecular disulfide, that's PRX5, that's an atypical to cis, PRX. And PRX6, 6 is the only one that has only the perosidatic system. We work with the typical 2-cis peroxyredoxins, and here's a summary of the catalytic cycle. The perosidatic system reacts with the peroxide substrate, and that step is called the peroxidation reaction. And once the sulfenic acid is formed, there is a conformational change in the active site that brings together the perosidatic system to the resolutive system to form the disulfide. That's one unique characteristic of peroxyredoxins. This resolution step to form the disulfide needs conformational change so that to form the disulfide. And then the reduction step where the disulfide is reduced to have, again, the thiolate reactive, and that usually is done by thioredoxin, thioredoxin reductase at the expenses of NADPH. And that's a way that we have to measure peroxidase activity with a spectrophotometer. We follow the oxidation of NADPH at 340 nanometers in time, and we can measure activity. I told you that peroxyredoxins are present in all organisms, but also at high concentrations. They are really abundant. Here's a table with reported uh, thiol peroxidases in different organisms, different isoforms. And I would like to point the concentration of PRX2 in the red blood cell is almost it's around 400 micromolar in the erythrocyte. 400 micromolar, that's a lot. We work a lot <laughs> with the um, PRX2 purified from human red blood cells. Here's a gel separating the proteins in the lysate of the erythrocytes. Hemoglobin, of course, is the most abundant protein present at 20 millimolar concentration. Here, the next protein band is carbonic anhydrase. And then here, around 20 kilodaltons, it's peroxyredoxin 2. So it's the third most abundant protein in the red blood cell. Oh. And for the red blood cell, it's one of the uh, critical antioxidant enzymes because the red blood cell is a cell that is really exposed to oxidative stress not only intracellularly, because it has 20 millimolar hemoglobin and the auto-oxidation of hemoglobin results in superoxide that dismutate to hydrogen peroxide. There is also uh, a NOS in the erythrocyte, amazing. But also circulating red blood cells are exposed to radicals and reactive species formed in the endothelium, like an O, there is also superoxide being formed by endothelial noxes, and the potential formation of peroxynitrate is there. So the red blood cell is um, exposed to a high oxidative stress. And if we look at the concentration of the peroxyredoxin in the red blood cell and the rate constants, with all the different potential targets inside the erythrocyte, like hemoglobin, glutathione, other peroxidases. But if we multiply the rate constants with the concentration of each target, we can easily see that PRX2 is the preferential target for hydrogen peroxide and also for peroxinite, the other peroxide. 
So it's a critical antioxidant enzyme for the erythrocyte. Well, another um, particular characteristic of the peroxyredoxin that we have to consider is their quaternary structure. The enzyme is present as a homodimer, and that's the minimal catalytic unit. Even though one subunit has both cysteines, perosidatic cysteine and resolutive cysteine, the enzyme works by forming intermolecular disulfide. So the dimer is the minimal catalytic unit holding two active sites. But then five dimers can arrange to form a decamer. And uh, there's an equilibrium between these two forms, decamer and dimers, for most of the two C's peroxyredoxins. We study oligomerization of peroxynitrate not only by size exclusion chromatography, SEC, because you can easily separate the dimer that it has uh, 44 kilodaltons molecular weight, and the decamer is 210 kilodaltons. But also we follow oligomerization using intrinsic fluorescence. If we look at the emission spectra of the protein, tryptophan emission, the decamer in black, the dimer in red, there is no big difference between the emission spectra of the two molecular species. But if we measure the lifetime of the tryptophans on each species, there is a more relevant difference between dimer and decamer. And using that and phasers to analyze time resolved fluorescence, we are able, we were able to determine the equilibrium binding constants, equilibrium binding, the equilibrium dissociation constants of the decamer into dimers. And we found that different isoforms have different values. We measure, we calculate this uh, parameter that is easier to handle than the KSUD, that is the consent, the total amount of peroxyredioxin is equally distributed between dimer and decamer. For isoform PUREX1, the CO5 is in the micromolar region, while for the PUREX2, is in the nanomolar region. And these two isoforms in humans uh, pretty much, the, it shares more than 90% sequence homology, yet they behave different. The peroxyredoxin 2 is present mainly as a decamer. You can find the dimer only at very low nanomolar concentrations, while the PRS1 in the micromolar range you can have the dimer also. So going back to kinetics and the catalytic cycle of the two C's in Rex, we can simplify the catalytic cycle in three steps. The peroxidation, that is the reaction with the peroxide substrate to form the sulfenic derivative. And then the resolution step to form the disulfide. Finally, the reduction at the expenses of thioredoxin. But looking in more detail, the catalytic complex, the catalytic cycle is more complex. I told you that after the sulfenic derivative is formed, there's a conformational change from the fully folded, the so-called fully folded, to the locally unfolded uh, PRX. And the locally unfolded actually brings together the peroxidatic system to the resolutive system and form the intermolecular disulfide. Some isoforms of PRX2 have a slow resolution step. So 
the sulfenic acid derivative lives longer and has the opportunity to react with another hydrogen peroxide. So the peroxidatic system is over-oxidized or hyperoxidized, and this hyperoxidation, of course, inactivates the enzyme, cannot longer be reduced by thyroidoxin. But an enzyme was found. Let me tell you that the oxidation of cysteine to the sulfenic SO2H state or SO2, three stage was considered for a long time an irreversible oxidation. But it was found enzymes called sulfuridoxin that at the expense of ATP, we are able to reduce the SO2H perosidatic system to the SOH system and go back to the catalytic cycle. And this enzyme sulfuridoxin only works with the overoxidized system of the peroxid reductions. And another classification between peroxid reductions appeared enzymes that were very sensitive to hyperoxidation were called sensitive. And enzymes that were very resistant to hyperoxidation were called robust peroxid reductions. Most of the bacterial prokaryotic peroxyredoxins are very resistant to hyperoxidation and robust PRX. The enzymes, the PRX, they have a fast resolution step that forms the dimer, the disulfide, easily, are less sensitive to hyperoxidation because the sulfenic acid leaves less so that it doesn't have a change to react with another soft peroxide substrate molecule. So fast resolution was associated with robust PRX. Also, if we look at the structure, the bacterial enzyme lack a YF motif at the C-term that it was present in the eukaryotic, very sensitive to hyperoxidation enzymes. So the YF motif at the C term was associated with sensitive peroxyredoxins. We did computational studies using the structure of PREX2 from red blood cells and the software Foldex, and that show us that residue 193 at the C terminal, it was a highly frustrated residue in this structure. Mutations on that residue that is a tyrosine for human PRX2 changes the whole stability and dynamics of the protein. So touching that residue at position 193 changes the stability of the enzyme. And if we mutate that tyrosine 193 in the wild type enzyme for a glycine, we show a very big change in conformation. And that residue glycine at that position, this stabilize the PRX2. But if we if we mutate with a filling ananide, on the contrary, reduce the region. Moreover, molecular dynamic simulations show that the C term of peroxyredoxin 2 was highly uh, fluctuated compared to the rest of the backbone. And if we mutate the residue Y93 for a glycine, the C terminal was even more flexible than the one type. So, the, the Y193G mutant has a higher C-terminal region flexibility. We prepare the recombinant mutants, and indeed, we show that the secondary and tertiary structure of the mutants change 
Here's the far UVCD spectrum. This is the emission spectra of the wild type and the Y193T mutant. And also thermal induced denaturation indicates a decrease in global stability of the G mutant. When we measure peroxidase activity, remember the couple assay where we follow activity by following the reduction of NADPH at 340 nanometers. This is the wild type in black and in gray, the G mutant. And that G mutant, it has a better peroxidase activity than the wild type. And if we test the sensitivity to high peroxidation, and using this couple assay, we found a nice easy way to sense sensitivity to high peroxidation, and that is to measure activity by increasing concentration of hydrogen peroxide. If the enzyme is resistant to high peroxidation, we increase the concentration of H2O2 and it's still active. We have almost the same slope. But when the enzyme is sensitive and it gets easily inactivated by high peroxidation, when we increase the concentration of hydrogen peroxide in the couple assay, we, we observe inactivation, I mean, curving of the rate. That happens with the wild type PRX2 that is very sensitive to hyperoxidation. So the mutation of uh, tyrosine Y93 for aglycine, this stabilized the C-terminal ration and that resulted in more resistance to hyperoxidation, thus a better peroxidase activity. Well, human PRX2 has uh, seven tyrosines in each subunit. And we know tyrosine can be modified specifically by peroxynitrate to form a nitro tyrosine. That's a post-translational modification that is specific for peroxynitrate or NO2. And um, we treated PRX2 with peroxynitrate and we analyze the uh, tyrosines being modified by nitration. And we found that three tyrosines were nitrated and one of those nitrated was 193. When we measure the activity of the nitrated enzyme, it responds the same as the G mutant we observed previously. I mean, here's the activity of the untreated enzyme. And after nitration, the enzyme was more active as a peroxidase. Here's a Western blot against the sulfinic acid derivative. So the nitrated enzyme it was less high peroxidized. And when we test, remember the sensitivity to high, high Russian peroxide, high peroxidation, with the couple assay, just increasing the concentration of substrate, we observed that the nitrated enzyme was more resistant to high peroxidation. So if we touch that residue at the YF motif, we can change activity and resistance to hyperoxidation. Hyperoxidation was proposed as a mechanism of modulating redox signaling by H2O2. Another way to study hyperoxidation we used was to follow changes in intrinsic fluorescence. Here's the emission spectra of the reduced and the disulfide oxidized. And we know that that fluorescence change. So we follow the kinetics of PRX oxidation by um, H2O2 in a stopped flow because the reaction is really rapid, really fast. 
And we saw first a decrease in fluorescence that we mix P uh, PRX, reduce PRX with H2O2. This fast decrease in fluorescence, see the time scale, very fast, nanoseconds. Milliseconds. This fast decrease in fluorescence is due to the peroxidation step. And then there is a slow recovery fluorescence that we associated with the resolution step. And depending on the amount of hydrogen peroxide, also it could be hyperoxidation. So following the change in intrinsic fluorescence and from the fast and the slow phases, we can determine the bimolecular rate constant of, high, of uh, reaction with H2O2 that, as I told you, is really, really high. And for human PRX2, it's one of the highest, 10 to the 8th per molar per second. It's almost diffusion control. And from the slow phase, second, the secondary plot gives us here the rate of the unimolecular step, that is the resolution step. And if we increase the concentration of hydrogen peroxide, we end up observing hyperoxidation. And from the slope here, we can determine the rate of hyperoxidation. And with these two values of rate contents, resolution and hyperoxidation, we determine a parameter called C hype 1% that it was first defined by Leslie Poole from Wake Forest University. C hype 1% is the concentration of H2O2 that yields 1% inactivated or hyperoxidized PRX. And we can see that the C hype 1% value is different for different isoforms. And that uh, gives us an idea of the sensitivity of the peroxyreduction to hyperoxidation. The PRX2 that we work with, human PRX2, is very sensitive to hyperoxidation. Five micromolar of H22 is able to inactivate 1% of the enzyme, while uh, peroxyreduction from a bacteria, for example, AHPC from Salmonella, it has a C hype 1% more than 5 millimolar. So it's very resistant to hydrogen peroxide hyperoxidation. And that sensitivity to hyperoxidation is not due to difference in the rate of hyperoxidation itself, because they are all around 10 to the third per molar per second for all the isoforms but the difference resides on the resolution step. The isoform that is more resistant to hyperoxidation is the one that has a slow resolution step. The more resistant, robust PRX have a very fast dimerization from the disulfide. So if we look at the catalytic cycle, and we love to do kinetics, we measure not only the rate constant of reaction with hydrogen peroxide, the substrate, that is really fast, as I told you, 10 to the 8th for most of the peroxyreduction isoforms. We also measure the resolution step, that is the one that differs between the enzyme forms. And more recently, we measure the third, the rate constant of a third step, that is the reduction with different thioreductions. And we also didn't find any difference between the isoforms, and it's also a really fast step. The red constant here for the reduction with thioreduction is around 10 to the 6 per mole per second. So if we calculate with, with these values of red constant, we calculated the amount of hydrogen peroxide that makes the three steps run at the same speed. We call it the hydrogen peroxide steady state. And we can see that um, for PRX2, 
The enzyme works with very low nanomolar concentrations of H2O2, but enzyme like AHBC works with uh, high micromolar concentrations of H2O2. So it looks like the different isoforms senses different concentrations of H2O2. The ones that um, have a slow resolution step senses very low nanomolar concentrations of H2O2, like PRX2, while PRX1 senses high nanomolar or almost micromolar concentration. And the PRX5 is more robust. And we think that um, these robust peroxyredoxin actually do not participate in signaling, but acts, behaves as antioxidant enzymes, just reducing hydrogen peroxide. So the resolution step is the rate limiting step. It marks the interaction with other cysteine redox protein, either with the CCP, the peroxidative cyclin, or after formation of the disulfide. So it's a critical step, the resolution step for PRX signaling in a redox relay mechanism. And this resolution step is different for each PRX isoform. So in the context of H2O2 induced uh, redox signaling, we have H2O2 as the second messenger, but the reaction of H2O2 with thiols, with any thiol, is not specific. But the fast reaction of H2O2 with the thiol of the peroxyredoxin, we think, gives specificity to the redox signal. And is we a long time ago, in 2013, proposed that peroxyredoxin are in the first line of the cascade of redox signaling with H2O2. The first reaction is H2O2 with the thiol of the PRX, and then PRX transmit the signaling either by reacting with the peroxidative system to form the disulfide, or making the intermolecular disulfide PRX, and that the disulfide reacts with the thiol of another redox protein. In 19, no, 19, no, in 2021, um, the group of uh, Tobias Dansen at the Netherlands publish a work that actually confirm our hypothesis, hypothesis. They work with the interactome of all 2 cis human PRX. They study the interactome of all 2 cis human PRX using the wild type PRX and also the mutants with serine at the peroxidatic system and at the resolutive system. And they found that PRX interacts with a, with a lot of uh, redox system proteins. There was, of course, overlapping, but also there was specific interactions of redox protein with each isoform PRX. And interestingly, they found that PRX isoforms with a slow resolution step like PRX2 form a disulfide binding with the peroxidatic system, while the isoforms with a fast resolution step like PRX5 or PRX1 interacts via disulfide with the resolutive system of the PRX. So let me finish with a few concluding remarks. 
we are sure, we are convinced <laughs> that peroxyredoxin have a central role in H2 to induce redox signaling. In fact, it gives the specificity to the signal, the fact that there's so fast reaction between the peroxidatic system of H with H202. Peroxyredoxin sensors of H202, each isoform senses different hydrogen peroxide levels. The PRX-dependent redox relay route is a significant redox signaling pathway. Robust PRX isoforms mainly act as antioxidant peroxidases, while sensitive PRX isoforms participate in signaling. Then we show that the C terminal of PRX is uh, present on sensitive PRX isoforms. It's a key site modulating not only PRX activity, but also susceptibility to hyperoxidation. And finally, let me say that uh, PRX are complex, are really diverse, and there are a lot of questions that are not answered yet. So we still need to keep on studying to finally uh, contribute to understand the role of PRX in redox signaling. Well, this is a picture of the group, part of the group at the School of Science. This was a meeting held in Punta del Este last year, the meeting of the Society for Redox Biology and Medicine. There is an American society but all the meetings were held in the United States until last year, the, that it was held for the first time in Punta del Este. Here is uh, Leah Randall, Gerardo Ferrer, Sebastian Bichard, people that work in peroxy reduction mainly. And then I would like to thank you for your attention, and I'm glad to answer any questions.